In this video I'm going to discuss five English translations, but before that I'm going to give you three basic principles which will be very helpful for you if you want to choose any translation. The first one comes from the book of Proverbs and it reads there, in an abundance of counselors there is safety. This is Proverbs 11 verse 14b. I'm taking this totally out of context, but I think I can apply this to the reading of Bible translations. And then it would mean something like, the more Bible translations you have, the better. This is what I would call the first rule of Bible reading. The second rule is this. There is no perfect translation. That is exactly why you need more translations, so you can compare the translations and come to a better understanding of the text. Anyone who speaks more than one language would know that in translating a text from one language to another, there is always something lost. Things like a nuance, a rhyme, a meter, a double meaning in a word, a keyword that is used over and over again and then all, the, all of a sudden turned on its head, a joke, a grammatical structure, or a name that has meaning. All of those things are extremely difficult to translate and often translations fail at them. An ancient saying about this problem is, who translates, betrays, who does not translate, deceives. And I think there is some wisdom in there as well. And then I come to my third and final rule. Any translation is better than none. And I'm very serious about this, because even the worst translation can have a valid point, a valid rendering of the text. One example I could give was a few months ago, I was studying the last four chapters of Isaiah. And I was comparing seven translations, seven different translations, because the, the Hebrew was very difficult and I needed some assistance. And out of those seven, it was the paraphrase that had the best rendering of the text. Of course, that was in my opinion, uh, I could be wrong, but I, I really thought that the paraphrase had the best translation of this difficult Hebrew phrase. Of course, that doesn't happen very often, but it is possible. Now, let's start off with those five translations I promised. The first one is the KGV. Where else to start? It's the King James Version. It was first published in 1611, and it is historically very significant, because it is the first English Bible that is fully based on the original Hebrew and the Greek. There have been partial translations before, there have been translations before that were partially based on the original text and partially on the Vulgate or uh, French and German translations, but this translation was the first one that was fully based on the original Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek. However, today you have to keep in mind that the KGV, despite its awesome quality, has outdated language. It is no longer modern English. It is archaic English. And there is a plus side to this. Don't forget, it has a plus side, because it uses thee and thou. And we don't like thee and thou, but thee, thou and also thine are singular. While on the other hand, you, ye and your are plural. And this does have a huge advantage when you compare it to only the you and your in modern translations. With the thee and the thou and the thine and the ye, you know whether it's singular or plural. And that's very, very handy at times. But there is also a downside to this, of course, because many of those words have lost their meaning. Or, they are still used today, but have a slightly different meaning. And this can be very, very tricky, and can sometimes lead to gross misunderstanding. Another thing you should keep in mind when reading the KGV, especially the New Testament, is that the Greek manuscripts that are translated are from the Byzantine tradition, or the TR, the Textus Receptus, that's Latin for the received texts, and these are from the so-called Byzantine tradition. There's also a last critical note I'd like to give on the KGV. Like I said, I really, really like the KGV. It's a great translation. But over the last 400 years, there has been a lot of research in the, in the Hebrew, in the Greek, and our understanding of the dynamics of those languages, the, uh, our understanding of specific words, has increased. Next up is the NKGV, the New King James Version. You might have guessed its name. It was first published in 1982, and it is much more modern English. And it is trying to be as good as the KGV, and at points has even improved, not only with the English language, but also with its understanding, its increased understanding of the original languages. And in order to stay in line with the KGV, they have chosen to also use the TR, or the Byzantine tradition, as their starting point for the New Testament. However, and this is one of the best things about the NKGV, in my opinion, is that in the footnotes, you have the Alexandrian tradition, so you can very easily compare the two traditions. Not only seeing that the differences are not that great, but also making it very accessible 
for you as a lay person, you don't need to learn Greek in order to see the differences between the Byzantine tradition and the Alexandrian tradition because they are in the footnotes.